Bonjour, je suis Charles Clavel, un palu de la 103e Regiment d'Infanterie et Territoriale. In today's video, I will be discussing how to pack and wear the knapsack worn by the French Army in World War I, the model 1893 Aversac. Also, I am preemptively asking you to please pardon my atrocious French. I had a difficult time putting my knapsack together when I first received it, but after trial, error, looking through several guides in both French and English, as well as being talked through it, I finally managed to put it together. Since I'm a very visual learner, this is the video that I wish had existed when I was first putting my pack together. My hope is that it will be helpful for any other green poilu out there who is assembling their pack for the first time. The model 1893 Avresac, or knapsack, was the primary way the French infantryman of the Great War carried his equipment. An archaic design dating to 1893, it had survived unchanged up to the start of the war in August of 1914. Though some minor construction differences were accommodated for due to wartime necessity, the As de Caro, or Ace of Diamonds, as it was sometimes called by the Poilu, due to its square shape, would remain largely unchanged through the end of the war to end all wars, save for much needed change in color. The pack consists of an interior wooden frame covered in an unpainted canvas body, the color of which varied from black, in pre-war packs, to beige, tan, or pea green, all of which quickly faded from exposure to a dull mustard. The interior wooden frame is made from thin planks wrapped in cheesecloth for reinforcement. My example, a reproduction made by Frog Sacks, is the pre-war black, and while not necessarily common by 1918, early packs such as this would have been issued as long as they were serviceable, and would have remained in use by second line troops such as territorial units, which is my impression. In addition to the two shoulder straps, there were six removable straps that attached to the outside of the pack via leather loops and fitted with buckles made of japanned iron. These consisted of two coureurs de capote or greatcoat straps, two coureurs de cote side straps, one grand coureur de charge or a large load strap, and one curio de Setois, a cross trap, which was used to secure the e-tool to the pack. When not in use, it was kept inside the pack. Begin with the shoulder straps. Each strap is correctly oriented with the brass stud facing inwards. The wide end is passed through the double prong buckle at the top of the pack and secured. Then, the thinner end of the strap is passed through the corresponding smaller buckle on the pack's bottom and secured. Each strap has a number of holes that allow the straps to be adjusted to the individual. Typically, one shoulder strap, usually the left, was fixed and the other one left undone to facilitate easier donning. Donning the Aversac will be covered at the end of the video. Flipping the pack around, pass the greatcoat straps from back to front through the sewn leather channels on top of the knapsack. Ensure that the buckles are correctly oriented. Next are the side straps. These pass from back to front through gaps in the stitching along the sides of the knapsack.
be sure to pass these around the internal wooden frame, which provides the necessary stability. Again, ensure the buckles are correctly oriented. Finally, the large load strap is attached. Ensuring the buckle is correctly oriented, begin by sliding the end of the large load strap through the metal loop at the center front of the pack. Pass it rearward through the next metal loop at the top edge of the flap, then down and through the loop at the bottom of the flap. For now, we will set the cross strap aside. The knapsack is now ready to be filled with its contents. As space was limited in the interior of the knapsack, it was to be packed in a specific fashion in order to make best use of the available room. The wartime regulation arrangement is as follows. The shirt is folded and placed so as to cover the rear of the pack to add as padding for the back, along with the handkerchief, which is folded and placed on top of the shirt. Along the bottom of the pack is placed two days of worth of reserve rations, typically consisting of hardtack biscuits and canvas sacks, one double bag of sugar and coffee, two cans of preserved meat, and two cans of condensed soup, though this could vary. In the middle of the pack were placed the bonnet de police, wash towel, and extra socks. Along with the toiletries, which included a soldier's mirror, razor, shaving brush, etc. In pre war manuals, the soldier's second musette was to be placed in the middle, containing the soldier's rest shoes, as well as both a weapon and double sided shoe brush. This practice was abandoned soon after hostilities began and two sets of maintenance equipment were distributed to each squad instead. This consisted of brushes, rifle cleaning, double-sided boot, and button brush, the patients, used to shine buttons, and the martinet, a small whip used to knock dried mud from a garment, all contained within a bag. A soldier tasked with carrying the maintenance kit would likely have placed it in the center of the pack as well. When going into an attack, up to 80 rounds of extra rifle cartridges and 10 packets of 8 rounds would have also been carried. At the top of the pack, the clothing brush, tent stakes,
and sewing kit are placed. Other small items that were not officially specified but are known to be carried by the Poilu in his knapsack included but weren't limited to spare shoelaces, often seen in the sewing kit, tin plates, trench cookers, and other personal cooking equipment, weapon cleaning kits, despite guidelines to the contrary, etc. These items were placed where convenient. The verrues, or jacket, when not being worn or carried in the baggage train, is folded lining side out and placed so as to cover entirely all preceding items, filling any remaining space within the pack. Finally, the soldier's booklet is placed in the flat pocket, when at the front, it is instead carried in the breast pocket of the greatcoat. The soldier's rifle cleaning rod was also slipped into the flat pocket to avoid losing it, though in wartime both the rifle cleaning kit and cleaning rod were officially to be carried in the baggage train. The flap is then closed and fastened with three small leather tabs and buckles on the bottom of the pack. While there was a certain degree of leeway in what a poilu might carry on the inside of his aversac, French regulations prescribed precisely how each item of a soldier's equipment was to be carried on its outside. While soldiers would have certainly followed these regulations for occasions such as formal formations and parades, in the field they would have arranged their packs according to individual preference and convenience, a practice which is evidenced in countless photographs. I will show the official practices as well as demonstrating a few common variations. Per regulations, the blanket was to be rolled into a horseshoe shape and placed over the top and sides of the pack. Informally, it could also either be made into a short roll and placed on top of the pack or, mimicking Colonial and Zoov troops, the blanket could be folded like an accordion along its short side and placed on top of the pack. Similar to the blanket, the tent canvas was also to be folded into a horseshoe with the two tent poles wrapped inside, which was then to be placed on top of the blanket. Alternately, the tent canvas could be rolled around the blanket, with the two parts making a single horseshoe. If the blanket had been made into a short roll or accordion, the soldier had several options. He could fold the tent canvas the same width and either wrap it around or fold it and place it under or on top of the blanket. Uh, 
or the tent canvas could be kept at, at its full length with the short rolled blanket inside. The roll could then be placed on top of the pack with the empty ends of the tent canvas being strapped down on the sides of the pack. The combination of blanket and tent canvas horseshoes are secured in place using the great coat and side straps, while the short roll or accordion would be secured by the great coat straps only. Each man carried at least one, if not more, portable entrenchment tool, the placement of which varied depending on the type of tool. There were many different tools issued by the French army, each with its own placement on the outside of the pack. Since I do not have examples of all possible tools, I will demonstrate with the two tools that I do have. The pelle beche, portative, or spade, and the serpe, or bill hook. The spade is placed on the left side of the pack, with a concavity against the pack. The side strap secures the tool to the side of the pack, passing through the loops on the tool's case. The tool handle is positioned vertically and maintained upright by using the cross strap. The bill hook, likewise, is placed flat against the left side of the pack, with the loop on the case facing outwards and the point towards the rear. It is then secured by the side strap, which passes through the case loop while the handle is held vertical by the cross strap, which is looped around the left greatcoat strap. If you were the unlucky man that was tasked to carry more than one entrenchment tool, tools such as the wire cutters or bill hook were often placed on top of the pack and held in place with the greatcoat straps, while the spade shovel was typically always left on the side. Like the entrenchment tools, each man carried at least one squad camping equipment. And like the entrenchment tools, placement varied depending on the type of implement. Again, since I do not have examples of each of the main implements used, I will demonstrate using the one that I do have, the si étoile or canvas bucket. The bucket was placed flat on the pack flap with bottom facing out. The free end of the large load strap is then passed under the cords located on the bottom of the bucket and brought back through the metal loop at the top edge of the flap. Most other camping equipment was similarly secured using the large load strap. The gamel, or individual mess kit, was placed on top of the blanket roll, slightly angled to the rear, and secured using the end of the large load strap. The running end of the large load strap was then fastened by the strap's buckle. The issue coffee grinder, which was of a similar size and shape to the gamel, was also attached in this manner. Additional items, such as an extra pair of boots, walking sticks when not in use, and anything else that couldn't be fit inside the pack or haversacks, could be placed on either side of the pack, 
all of which could be secured with straps or twine. Finally, all the loose strap ends are tidied by rolling them in on themselves. In order to achieve the roll on top of the mess kit that is often seen in period drawings and in photographs, pass the end of the large load strap back through the D-ring on top of the gamel before rolling it. The pack is now completely assembled. The knapsack's weight, when fully fitted out, was approximately 25 to 30 pounds, though some soldiers testified it could be as much as 45 pounds. At the command, sac a dos, the soldier lifts the pack and slides his left arm through the left shoulder strap and places it on his shoulder. He then grasps the end of the right shoulder strap and pulls it upward, dragging the right side of the pack up his shoulder. While holding the strap tightly, the soldier then leads forward slightly and pulls the shoulder strap down and behind him, bringing the end of the strap to the buckle. Finally, he runs the strap through the buckle at the desired length and fastens it. If the load is particularly heavy, the soldier might turn to his neighbor for assistance in lifting the pack and buckling the right shoulder strap. But if an ami is not around, he should simply lean against a convenient tree, trench wall, or building to hold the weight of the pack while he fastens the strap. I hope that you found this video helpful and interesting. It combines several different guides for packing the 1893 opera sack, notably that of the 151st Regiment of Infantry of Line, the link to which I have posted in the description below, and also the advice given to me by my friend and veteran French reenactor, Jean. Merci, mon ami.